this is where we left off for fourth period, chapter 12. We're picking up in the section about the Mongolians and Islam. So when you look at the Mongolian rivalry, you'll see when the Mongolians came into the lands that were controlled by the Muslims, they established in what is present-day Iran a state called the Ilkhan. The Muslims didn't care too much for the Mongolians because the Mongolians had killed the last Abbasid Caliph, and the Mongolian beliefs were very contrary to the beliefs of uh, Islam. Batu, who was the leader of the Golden Horde, had actually converted to Islam, and he avenged, uh, or he he promised that he would avenge the death of the last Caliph because he was identifying with Islam more than he was his Mongolian heritage. So this is going to cause a lot of conflict amongst the Mongolians. When you look specifically at the Ilkhan, that uh, Mongolian state set up in present-day Iran, it's important to note that they collected as many taxes as possible, and this harsh policy of tax collection led to the Ilkhan weakening. And this is going to give a rise uh, to a man by the name of Timur, named Tamerlane. He was Turkish by descendancy. He was only related to the Mongolians through marriage. And he took over India. He killed the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. He was preparing to invade China when he died in 1405. So he wanted to establish, he claimed to be Mongolian. He wanted to establish a uh, Mongolian uh, empire, uh, much like the ones in the previous two centuries had been set up. It's important to note that uh, Islamic culture does continue to thrive under Mongolian rule, specifically when it comes to math and science. Uh, make a note of uh, the advancements they made with studying uh, eclipses and calculating pi. When we look to Russia, we see that um, the Russians faced a lot of economic problems when they were under Mongolian rule. Number one, uh, for economic problems that they faced, overzealous tax collection by Russian princes. Number two, the burden of taxation was carried by the peasants. Number three, the attempt to introduce paper money by the Mongolians. This was unsuccessful because the paper money had no value. People had no faith in it. And number four, a direct exchange of goods rather than currency. And this is because the Mongolians are hoarding all of the gold and silver. And so there isn't a lot of it available on the market. So people will have to revert to bartering instead of using money. In 1480, Ivan III, um, let me back up just a minute. I apologize. Um, the Russian princes were in charge of collecting taxes. The Mongolians just wanted them to turn the tax money over to them, but they let the Russian princes collect it. This is um, going to allow the Russian princes to hoard some of this wealth and use it to create an army that is eventually going to overthrow the Mongolians. Uh, and this happens uh, around 1480, Ivan III. He's a prince of Moscow. He ends the Mongolian rule, and he adopts the title of czar, and so that's where we have the first czar of uh, the Russians. There was also some resistance in Europe, in the West. The Teutonic Knights, who are German-speaking warriors, resisted the Mongolian invasion of Europe. And after the Mongolians left Anatolia, the Ottoman Empire was established, and they would eventually take over Constantinople in 1453. Moving on to China, we mentioned briefly last class the Yin Dynasty. Uh, this is an empire set up in China, this is the Mongolians. They successfully take over the Song, the Jin. Uh, when the Mongolians first came into China, it was very fragmented. Think about the, all the conflict between the Lao, the Jin, the Song that we talked about. Kublai Khan is able to take over China and establish a Mongolian empire, and he sets up his capital as Beijing. Uh, the Mongolians used Western Asian Muslims as officials. The role of Confucianism went down, and because the Mongolians were very much into setting up tributary states and taking over new land, this is going to allow the status of merchants to rise in China, which it had never been high before, and there's going to be an increase in trade. The Mongolians needed money, so they introduced paper money to China. But again, uh, just like in Russia, people didn't have much faith in it. Copper was the desired element that people wanted. And uh, they trusted copper, the Chinese people trusted copper a lot um, because it was being traded to Japan. And so the Mongolians uh, stopped the trade with Japan because they wanted to keep the copper in China to restore economic stability. During the Yin period, the Chinese population decreased by as much as 40%. And it decreased mostly in northern China in the if you ask the question, why does the Chinese population decrease by 40%, uh, there's some simple answers. Number one, warfare. People are dying. Uh, number two, there's uh, records of some flooding on the Yellow River. 
number four, um, sorry, number three, there's a north-south migration going on. The people in the northern part of China are moving south to get away from the Mongolians. And there's also begins to be a spread of disease, including the bubonic plague. The fall of the Yin Empire in the 1340s, fighting broke out against the Mongolian princes. In 1368, a Chinese leader uh, named uh, Zhu Yan, uh, Zhang, uh, I'm butchering his name, Z-H-U, Y-U-A-N-Z-H-A-N-G. He overthrows the Mongolians, and he establishes the uh, Ming Empire. The Mongolians still held the power in Central Asia, but by 1368, the Mongolians have lost China to the Ming Empire. And there will be a separate video that I will post that will pick up the section in the, the textbook, Chapter 12, the early Ming Empire, 1368 to 1500.